I'm going to begin by asking you to take a look at this scene here and tell me what you see. And someone might say, well, I see a sunset or I see uh, an unusually cloudy day over the Sonoran Desert or I see a bunch of cacti. There are a number of different possible responses, but even without hearing them, I can already tell you, you're all wrong. What you actually have here is a scale limited image of the scene. There's a lot that you don't know. Uh, the image is limited by the field of view. For example, there might be someone standing off to the left or the right of this picture. You just don't know. Uh, the number of pixels, you don't have the resolution that you require to see the individual needles on the cacti. So it's not really a complete picture of anything in this scene. There's a lot of uncertainty in this picture if you think about it. Nonetheless, I would argue that this picture is fit for purpose. It's a nice looking picture, it's a pretty picture, and I might even convince you to relocate to Arizona. But what about now? So I've, I've fuzzed up this picture a little bit and you look at it and you say, well, you know, actually now it's not so pleasing. Uh, maybe it's a little bit more artistic to someone's eye, but for most people you would say that this picture is really no longer fit for purpose. It somehow has lost enough information that it's no longer serving the intended purpose. Now let's try going the other way. Let's improve the ladder resolution, but at the expense of field of view by magnifying. Uh, now we have some more detail, but we can't even tell where we are anymore. So we've lost so much context because of the smaller field of view that this image also is no longer fit for purpose. What this means is our optical system, our camera, is designed to capture an image with well-defined, predefined scale limitations. It's not really designed to capture all of the information about an object. So how, do, how are we going to describe image sharpness in a way that will allow us to quantify some of these considerations? So we, we could use the modulation transfer function. This is something that this crowd is, is familiar with. So on the right-hand side is a resolution target, and on the left-hand side is that resolution target converted into some kind of MTF. The interesting thing about this MTF is that uh, between these limits of the field of view and the lateral resolution, we have this continuously declining response so that the image contrast is actually progressively worse with spatial frequency. Maybe this is something we could fix. Well, uh, to answer that question, let's see if we could sharpen it up. So this is a tool that I have here in PowerPoint, so I can just, I can just do this. So let me go run, run the sharpening tool. There we are. Now we've sharpened up the image, uh, at least part of it. In terms of the MTF, this sharpening tool that I have in PowerPoint does the following. We've made the MTF a little bit more square or rectangular. So we've enhanced some of the mid-spatial frequencies. And now we see an image which is qualitatively different, but in fact, it doesn't have any higher resolution than it did before. So let's take a look at a, at a typical MTF. Uh, here we have some curves from Microscopy University uh, from Nikon showing three, dis three different objectives, high performance and varying performance and low performance objectives. And let's take a look at the, the good response curve. The good response curve, which is the red one, uh, uh, shows a progressively declining fringe contrast uh, as a function of spatial frequency. In other words, the fringe contrast measurement, if you will, is never right. Nonetheless, this is called a good response. It is the expected response and actually conforms to, to a diffraction limited objective. So this tells us that errors in the MTF are deviations from the expectation. There's no ideal MTF. For some perspective, let's take a look at the equivalent of the MTF for surface topography measurements, for example, with this interference microscope. For example, I might ask the question, uh, can I measure this particular part, which is pretty challenging. It's a resolution standard, center line width is only 200 nanometers wide. Can I, can I see that with an interference microscope? If you go ahead and make the measurement, you find out that, that in fact you can. You can see these two lines in an interference microscope at high magnification. The strange thing is that the trench depth measures only three nanometers, not 26 nanometers. So what's going on here? 
The problem here is that we often use single numbers like the Rayleigh criterion, the Sparrow criterion, or the Abbe limit for optical imaging and also for instruments like interference microscopes that use imaging systems uh, as part of the measurement principle. The single number is helpful, but it's really not sufficient. It doesn't tell you why you measure three nanometers when in fact you have 26 nanometers for uh, the depth of those features that we saw in the previous slide. To really characterize the behavior of these instruments, you would like to use something like the MTF, and that's called the instrument transfer function in the context of topography measurement. And it's been defined in the ISO standards as a curve describing an instrument's height response as a function of the spatial frequency of the surface topography. So very similar to the MTF, but now we're talking about surface heights. In practice, the ITF declines a spatial frequency and the response of the instrument, like an imaging instrument, is 100% only for a flat featureless surface. In other words, for a zero spatial frequency, which can be kind of surprising, maybe even disappointing. For non-zero spatial frequencies, the response arguably is wrong. Or is it? What is the ideal ITF? What would be the ideal response of the instrument? You, you know you have some limit out there, but before you get to that limit, do we want a declining response or do we want it to be a little bit more square, like this? A flat response uh, going up to some limit point and then suddenly stopping. Uh, there is an argument that the, the picture on the right is more like what we would like to have in a measuring instrument than the picture on the left. To answer this question about what the preferred ITF should be, let's take a look at this rectangular profile grading under both conditions. We have the gradually declining ITF that we'll call A, and then B is the, the sharp edge, the one that has the rectangular profile. So we can, uh, we can do a vote, uh, how many people like A or B, uh, and it might actually be different depending on your application or what the purpose is of your task. But very often, the result on the left is more preferred because it has fewer of the kinds of ringing artifacts that you see on the right in the example of B. Let's compare this result with filtering, the kind of post-processing filtering you apply even with a stylus tool that has a very different behavior, a very different response. Uh, you can get a fairly flat response out of a stylus tool, but very often we apply filters and immediately undo that flat response. So this is kind of a long wave filter, uh, often applied to a stylus tool by default, where you introduce a declining response as a function of spatial frequency. Partly you do this to avoid the nonlinear behavior when you get close to the stylus tip width. So what does ISO say, the International Standards Organization say, about the optical instrument ITF, which we encounter so frequently in surface topography measurement? Well, what they say is that an optical method may provide an inherent filter, that's the ITF, that approximates a Gaussian filter, the kind of filter that you would apply intentionally if, in fact, the instrument transfer function were flat. So let's take a look at the same surface with different spatial filters. And what you see is on the left, the quote unquote unfiltered, which is limited actually by the transfer function characteristics of the instrument, and then some imposed modest filtering and then some heavy filtering. This is the same surface, but we're just looking at it with different filters applied. So what does this, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that whether it's an applied filter in software or something inherent to the instrument, the measurand, the thing that you're measuring is not the surface topography per se, it is the scaled limited surface. It is some representation of the surface with scaling limits applied. So that means that we don't need to fix the ITF by making a square, at least not necessarily. We, we just need to know what it is. To determine what the ITF is, we can measure it in a number of different ways. We can use different types of standards. There isn't actually a lot of agreement about how to do it. We like to use the edge spread function where you compare the sharpness of an edge measured and theoretical to get the ITF. 
But do I have to do this every time uh, I want to make a measurement? Do I have to calibrate experimentally for the ITF? And that doesn't seem like it's a very attractive solution. It's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it's useful to simulate the response using physical models, and this is a current area of research. For example, we often use at, at Zygo a Fourier optics model of interference microscopy that looks at scalar diffraction theory and sees how the, the different diffracted orders are propagated through the optical system in order to simulate interference patterns like you see on the right-hand side for a sinusoidal surface in white light uh, interferometric techniques. Here's an example where we've compared the theoretical prediction of scattering theory for the ITF with the measurement of the instrument transfer function using a, a sharp step. And we see a, a really good agreement here. So these are different approaches. We can experimentally determine the ITF. We can theoretically determine the ITF. But uh, there is another question that's raised by all of this of whether we need the ITF at all. If you ask this guy, he might say, uh, I, I don't really care about the ITF. I don't know what it is and I don't want to measure it. Uh, I, have, I have different priorities. My manufacturing requires agreement between the seller and the buyer, functionality of parts and systems, interchangeability of parts, reliability of all of my instruments, and above all, some kind of consistency. So none of these strictly require knowledge of the ITF. Knowing the ITF can be really important if you're trying to correlate results between different instruments. For example, a stylus tool and an optical tool. You would like to be able to get the same kinds of results and that requires that the spatial frequency limits, including any attenuation between the high and low spatial frequency limits, is the same for both instruments. And then you can get really good correlation between the two. It's not an easy task, but it's what you got to do. Another task that requires knowledge of the ITF is linking different metrology scales. This is an extreme ultraviolet lithography mirror that, where you require a huge range of spatial frequencies and that requires different instruments you'd like to tie together these results. Another example is for optimization, choosing the right instrument configuration. This goes back to fit for purpose. And then finally, there's this question of traceability to the unit, which is one of the ways you can achieve all of the goals that I described previously uh, by uh, making a measurement where you've taken into account all of the characteristics that are involved in an uncertainty analysis. So uh, what about the uncertainty? Is this a map of measurement errors that has to be put into an uncertainty budget? And I would say no, the ITF is not an error curve. It's simply a description of how the instrument responds. The uncertainty comes in when we talk about the uncertainty in the ITF. How well do we know the ITF? That's what you have to include in your uncertainty budget. The ITF, in some sense, is part of defining the measure end. How well you measure the measure end uh, is determined by the uncertainty in the ITF and any other filtering that you apply. So we've seen that the MTF quantifies imaging performance. However, the MTF error is the difference between the results and expectations. So the desired MTF is the one that is fit for purpose and how well you get there tells you, tells you whether or not you've achieved your goal. For the instrument transfer function, which I described loosely as the MTF of topography measurement, we have similar observations. We can measure the ITF and often we can predict it with theory. Uh, and the uncertainty of the ITF is what goes into an uncertainty budget, not the ITF itself. I think this is perhaps the most salient point worth, worth discussing amongst those of us that do surface topography measurement. Well, all right then, so uh, I've had my say, now it's your turn. Uh, what do you think about the MTF? Is it an error plot? Should the ITF be made flat up until a sharp cutoff? I really look forward to hearing from you about what your thoughts are on, on these ideas sometime soon in person, if possible. Uh, until then, have a great conference and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.